Was Jesus actually resurrected? That's a question that a lot of people have asked me. And today on the Accessible Apologetics Show, we want to talk about cultural and historical facts that everyone should know. See, one of the unique things about Jesus is that no other teacher was believed to have risen from the dead. That's one of the things that makes Jesus unique. And I want to start out this episode of the Accessible Apologetics Show by telling you a quick story about how when I was at a family gathering around Easter time, uh, there was a woman who came to confront me about the resurrection. And her whole thing was that the resurrection didn't really happen and that Jesus really wasn't bodily raised from the dead, but it was a story that the disciples made up or it emerged decades and decades later because they needed some kind of Messiah figure to help them out emotionally. And that was her whole thing that she wanted mm -hmm. to tell me about. That's kind of what we're going to talk about today. When someone comes to you and wants to talk to you about the resurrection and they have these kinds of ideas, how can we respond in a thoughtful way as ambassadors of Jesus? Now, if we're just meeting, I'm Dr. Mikel Del Rosario. I'm your apologetics guy, and I want to welcome you to the Accessible Apologetics Show. On this episode, we're going to talk about um, a historical look at where the concept of a Messiah rising from the dead even came from. Like, where would you even get that idea? Um, is it likely that the disciples just made this whole thing up or that it emerged all on its own through just people um, having these cultural conceptions of a Messiah? And my guest on the show today is Dr. Justin Bass. Justin is a New Testament professor at Dallas Christian College, and he is a fellow PhD graduate here at Dallas Theological Seminary, also a New Testament PhD grad. And he is the author of this book called The Bedrock of Christianity, The Bedrock of Christianity. And so I want to welcome you, Justin, to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks, brother. Great to be on with you. Well, I want to just jump right into our topic today. It's an exciting one. Um, here on this show, we try to help people answer tough questions that people ask about the Christian faith and uh, respond to these doubts that some people have, even people who are Christians who hear things in the public square um, that challenge the resurrection of Jesus, among other Christian truth claims. But it is a bedrock fact that uh, on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, he was betrayed by Judas and his followers fled and they left him. What would be the mindset, um, you think, of disciples of Jesus on this night after their leader had been captured and then killed, executed on a cross by Rome? What would be going through their minds? Crushed. <laughs> Absolutely crushed. I, um, you know, I've tried to really think about that. You know, it's, it's a great thing to do when you're, you know, studying the, not just the, the, the books of the Bible, but anything of history, try to put yourself back into their mindset as best as you can and, and just trying mm -hmm. to imagine what it was like uh, that good Friday evening, that Saturday morning. I doubt they slept much that, that Friday night. And then even Saturday night, where were they hiding? Were they all together? It seems like maybe some of them were uh, separate. The women were clearly separate going to the tomb and things. But I, I think that story in uh, Luke 24, where uh, Cleopas and his buddy, are uh, you know walking on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus comes up with them and and has that conversation. I think I think in what they say we get an idea of their mindset. I think it really captures what they were thinking because it's really humorous because uh, Jesus is asking them, you know, what what's been going on, and they're like, what have you been? Have you been living under a rock? You don't know what's been happening. Mm -hmm. And Jesus mm -hmm. says, what things? I love that. <laughs> in Greek, it's just one word. Poya. What, what things? What things? And then uh, he goes on to explain, well, this man, Jesus, you know, he did all these mighty deeds. Uh, ultimately, you know, we thought he was the Messiah, but he was crucified. You know, mm. and, and he says, we had hoped, we had hoped he was the Messiah. He would redeem Israel. But clearly he wasn't because he was crucified. And so I think that captures, especially uh, Peter, John, you know, all the, all the key disciples of Jesus. They must have been absolutely convinced that he was no longer the Messiah anymore, no matter how much they loved him. Mm -hmm. and, and they were amazed by him. And in awe of him, they were convinced now by this crucifixion, by his death, by his burial, that he's not the Messiah. And so they mm -hmm. were you know, as depressed as you could be. You know, this was, this was the, the in, in some people's minds, you know, this may be the saddest moment in history in their hearts yeah. you know, for what yeah. they were experiencing a crucified messiah is almost a contradiction in terms right you don't overthrow rome you're executed by rome hence probably not the messiah it was obviously uh, a death blow to the movement um, in, in many senses of the word yes. um, and yet it is also a bedrock historical fact not only that jesus was crucified but that his disciples had real experiences that they believed at least 
were experiences of the risen Jesus. And it wasn't just that the tomb was found empty, it was that people actually believed they saw him after he was publicly executed and crucified. And so the question that most apologists jump to at this point is what caused that belief? And then we say that the resurrection best fits the known historical facts. Uh, but again, going back to the conversation that I had with this woman and, and other people I've talked to, you know, the idea that maybe the disciples just made it all up or that it just emerged after decades and decades from uh, cultural ideas that Jewish people had. I want to explore this a little bit more um, to help people think through those concerns. So let's back up and even think about where did this category even come from? You know, mm -hmm. was there, were there any traditions of a Messiah being raised to life or an expectation of that? Yeah, the simple answer is no. I mean, as, as you know, I had a, had a conversation with uh, Dr. Dale Allison uh, uh, recently on uh, Justin Briarly's Unbelievable. And, uh, you know, he reaffirmed this and, you know, he has about 30 years on us of reading and I, I, he's one of those people that has read everything mm -hmm. and he has, he's made clear, no, I mean, and all my research and everything that, that we've found, there is no evidence of an expectation of a resurrected Messiah, that a Messiah would rise again from the dead, like the pro like prophesied in the Old Testament, you know, especially places like Daniel 12, that, uh, that there would be this general resurrection of the wicked and the righteous. Uh, Jews expected that at the end of the world, but they did not expect a Messiah to do that in the middle of history. And then history continue on, and then there be that general resurrection at the end. Mm -hmm. The way Paul puts it, you know, that he's the first fruits. And then when Jesus returns, we will all, you know, raise, be raised with him at the, in this harvest imagery. Um, no expectation for that. So where did they get that idea? You know, where, where did that idea come from? Uh, even if they had, let's say they had the only other option you really have on the table is maybe some sort of hallucination. They believe that, you know, uh, you know, some, something in their mind made them think Jesus came to life again and appeared to them uh, like an apparition or something. But that, still wouldn't have led them to say that he rose from the dead. They mm -hmm. would That would not have led them to say resurrection language. It would have led them to say maybe that, you know, Jesus is, is the great martyr. He's been exalted to heaven. He's he's in the heaven. He's still alive in heaven with God. Like Jesus said, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, or uh, even the, the Maccabean martyrs, you know, the way they're, they're presented as being, you know, exalted to heaven and, and um, you know, they're still alive and they're, they're awaiting the, the resurrection, but not that he would be, he is raised from the dead. This, this, I think this category is unexpected, completely innovative, and demands a historical explanation. Hmm. Yeah, thinking about the cultural milieu that all this happened in, uh, in, most Greeks and Romans didn't believe in a resurrection. We know some Jews, like the Sadducees, didn't believe in a resurrection. But for the Jews who did hope for a resurrection, are there any Jewish texts that you can think of, whether they're in the Old Testament or outside, uh, that help us understand the kind of uh, resurrection that they were expecting, like a bodily resurrection, or was it just like a, a more like visionary spiritual one? Or how do we know what they expected? Yeah, I think I think the evidence is very strong that, that the Jewish idea of resurrection, anastasis, this this Greek word that that that's used by Paul in First Corinthians fifteen and uh, used elsewhere in uh, in Jewish uh, literature at that time, it's it's bodily, and we're talking about bodies. We're talking mm -hmm. about physical bodies, physical matter. But very clear passages, I think, would be like uh, what I referenced earlier in Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 12, that it says, many who sleep in the dust of the earth will rise, some to everlasting shame and contempt, and some will shine like the stars in the, in the, in the heavens. And so that's very clearly, you know, of the dust, they will rise. This is a physical resurrection. You also have uh, in between the Old Testament uh, books and the, the New Testament books, you have uh, the books of the Maccabees which testifies to, you know, these, these tortures that the Maccabean martyrs went through, and mm -hmm. also the, the seven sons that, that went through this torture uh, of this mother. And, and one of them, you know, puts forward his, his two arms, and he says, cut off my arms, and I'll get them back at the resurrection. You know, but yeah. clearly the idea that I'm going to get them back uh, mm -hmm. one day in a physical way, I'm going to get my, my body is coming back <laughs> to the earth, I'm going to, I'm going to rise again. And I think this is definitely the the view of Paul, we see it throughout his letters that uh, just like Jesus was raised, we also will be raised, you know, Philippians 3 and, and Romans 8, you know, make clear that this is something that's going to happen to our to our bodies. There's a redemption of the soma. There's a, the, the redemption of the body. Um, so 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 I think all the evidence is, is uh, uh, very, very overwhelming. And, and N.T. writes, you know, as you know, resurrection of the son of God. I mean, his first 200 pages is basically demonstrating this. And uh, and I think it's 
I think it's overwhelmingly strong that when they say resurrection, the Jew, when the Jews said resurrection, that's what they meant. They meant bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the concept of a Messiah. We're trying to put these two things together, the idea of resurrection that was hoped for, the idea of, of Messiah, but nobody ever put those two things together. Mm -hmm. What did most Jews hope the Messiah would actually do? Well, kind of like you referenced before about the different, you know, views on, on resurrection, you know, it depended on the Jew for the Messiah. We, you know, we only have such a small amount that has come down to us, but, you know, from, from that, from that world. Uh, so, so we can't know everything, but from what we do know that they had these different views of the Messiah. Some were just not even interested in a Messiah. It seems like the, the more Hellenistic Jews, the Jews that are, that are scattered around uh, far away from their homeland, far away from from uh, Jerusalem, from Judea, uh, people like Philo of Alexandria, I think in all of his writings, and we have a lot, uh, he mentions, uh, possibly mentions a Messiah type figure twice. Uh, he, it's clearly not an emphasis for him. You know, he's wedding Greek philosophy with, with uh, the Torah, with the law of Moses. It seems like Jews scattered out in the di diaspora uh, are not as much interested in the Messiah. It seems like the same for the, uh, uh, for the Sadducees, you know, they're far more political, far, far more associated with what's going on on earth, on the, at the temple in Jerusalem. They, it doesn't seem like they're much, you know, looking for the Messiah. But um, we know the Essenes, uh, because of the De Dead Sea Scrolls, we know they were looking for two messiahs, a Davidic type messiah, a warrior type messiah, and then a priestly, more mm. er ironic type uh, messiah. And so, um, and, and in fact, it's amazing when they, when they do the the calendar dating of, of the Essenes to our calendar when they when they put them together, they were actually expecting them, these messiahs somewhere around. I saw one one uh, dated to three BC, so it's kind of amazing they were expecting the messiah to come at the exact same time when we believe the messiah did come, which was Jesus. Hmm. Um, and I think it's because they were reading the same the right text. They were reading Daniel, and uh, Daniel nine you know lays out the the seventy weeks, and so they were probably interpreting that, uh, and they were I think they got pretty close. Um, but the Pharisees probably capture, I think, the, uh, the majority, at least, of Jews who were in Jerusalem, in Judea, the, the everyday, you know, passionate Jew who believed the Torah, who believed the prophets, uh, people like Jesus's followers, uh, probably his, his 12 thought this way, Paul definitely thought this way, we know Josephus thought this way, and it was, it was the expectation of a warrior-type Davidic-like Messiah who would free them from the Romans. Um, you know, I, I always, in the past, uh, I'm outdated now, but in the past, I used to say a Schwarzenegger like Messiah, but now mm -hmm. I say a John Wick like Messiah. <laughs> so they, were, they were looking for the John Wick uh, Messiah. Yeah. Um, and, and, a, and a great text that people can look up is from the Psalms of Solomon. It's a, it's a writing uh, written by a, a Pharisee, uh, probably about 100 BC, about 100 years before Jesus. And it lays out this conquering warrior, <laughs> John Wick type messiah that's going to just destroy all the gentiles and that's that's i think what they were most of them were expecting like like james and john when they come to jesus and they say jesus let us sit at your right and your left at, when you come in your kingdom i mean mm -hmm. I, I think they're thinking physical kingdom you know when yeah. you go to jerusalem and you wipe them off the face of the earth and it's now the messianic kingdom we want to reign sitting at your right and your left mm -hmm. that's why jesus says you don't know what you're talking about Hmm. But, but yeah, that's what I think. Physical kingdom, physical Messiah, you know, uh, Davidic type warrior. That, that's what they were looking for. Release them from the Romans. I think that was the, uh, a very mm -hmm. prominent view. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the charge against Jesus was translated over to Rome as a, as a sedition charge. And they put the uh, mm -hmm. sign above the cross, uh, above his head that said, King of the Jews. Um, talk about that a little bit. Do you call that a bedrock fact in your research? Is that something that you think is a bedrock fact? Yeah. And, 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 just, and just to clarify, when I say bedrock fact throughout the book, what I mean is this high bar of, uh, it, which is fascinating that we even have facts like this, uh, you know, well beyond Jesus's existence and his crucifixion, we have a lot of facts that reach this high bar, which I call bedrock, which is basically across the board, you know, scholars for the last 250 years of, of biblical criticism um, today and, and over the last 250 years, you know, I, I would say even like 98, 99 percentile, they would agree on these certain facts. So that's what, what it takes to, to be, to reach that high bar of a bedrock fact. Mm. And yeah, I would, I would call this a bedrock fact of the gospels. I mean, from, from my studies, uh, my research, I find that this is something that's agreed upon by everyone, you know, atheists, 
uh, Jewish, liberal, conservative, everyone agrees that, that Jesus had this sign nailed to the cross with him that was basically the sign of his crime, his crime, that he claimed to be king of the Jews. Now, what it, it exactly said, you know, of course, that's debated because the Gospels give us different, um, uh, some, some have it longer, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, and some say just the king of the Jews, but everyone agrees that it said the, the, the king of the Jews. I think Raymond Brown the great uh, New Testament scholar of the 20th century, he, he says in his big two volume, The Death of the Messiah, he says, it's historically unimpeachable. <laughs> hmm. uh, th this is one of those things that, it, and it's extraordinary because it's the one thing that was written about Jesus during his, his life that we yeah. know, you know, we don't have it, but we know it was written, you know, it's, as far as if you trust, you know, scholars and historians, we know that was written. And, uh, and, and, it, and it, what it shows is, is that Jesus uh, was seen by Rome as one of these messianic type pretenders that, that they were used to. There was quite a, like I said, there was uh, at least 14 of them, uh, hmm. uh, others that were like Jesus. Um, big difference, of course, is Jesus didn't actually fight against Rome. Yeah, yeah. But, but he, was he was treated the same way and as, 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 as a threat, and, and that's why um, they crucified him. So a lot of times people will ask, was there anything written about Jesus during his lifetime? And they kind of make a big point about that, you know, and of course we can talk about first century authors like Josephus, who's writing about the Jewish role in Jesus' death, or Tacitus, who's writing about the Roman role in Jesus' death. But uh, for some people, they, they want to go back even further. And we say, well, you know, if we don't really have any texts about Jesus during his lifetime, but this is actually one that I think is pretty amazing. Um, for those who don't see the Bible as an authority, it's hard for them to think about it because it's kind of like the creed in 1 Corinthians 15. It was it predates the New Testament writing, but people have to find, you know get to the point where they're like, okay, just because it's in the Bible, it doesn't mean that it was created at the time of writing. It existed beforehand. What's right. some of the evidence that would help people um, see that that sign that we read about in the Gospels is not just something that was only in the Gospels, but evidence that actually convinces Jewish and atheist scholars that it was um, in existence. I mean, one of them is one of the facts is that it, it fits the uh, the picture of crucifixion that we get from other writers like uh, Seneca and Suetonius, and um, you know, there's many many writers who, who speak about um, what it was like for for some, you know what what happened when someone was crucified. And one of the things uh, that they describe is that they would carry uh, around their neck usually the, the uh, a sign that that had their crime written mm. on it, and then that crime would then be nailed to the cross in some way. And so it fits with with that description. But I think the primary thing that 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 uh, convinces uh, even even skeptics on this is just the the title itself. Uh, the King of the Jews is not a title that's used by anyone else in the New Testament for Jesus. And even among the early church fathers and, you know, go through all of really church history, uh, mm -hmm. no one is calling Jesus the king of the Jews. Mm. Um, that, that's, not, that's not a common title used. It, you know, they might refer back to this text and then say, yes, he really is the king of the Jews. I mean, that's the irony of the, of the story. But this wasn't a title that that was being used. It's, it's similar to, I, I used the parallel in that Josephus passage about, about Jesus, the famous one, where there are interpolations. But in that passage, Josephus calls Jesus a wise man, mm -hmm. and he calls Jesus a worker of paradoxa, of, of wonderful works. Uh, these are words that show up in other, place in, in other places of Josephus, and these are words that are never used of Jesus by the New Testament or mm -hmm. the early church fathers. So it's, it's, it's a strong argument that Josephus probably did say this about Jesus. This is probably how Josephus described him, at least in those in those uh, places. So in the same way, this is probably reflecting um, uh, history here that, that this is how he was uh, presented when he was nailed to the cross. This was his crime. He claimed to be the king of the Jews, you know, but, but of course, Pilate just put the king of the Jews probably to, to tick the, the Jewish leaders off. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they got mad at him and said, no, 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 don't say that. Say he claimed to be the king of the Jews. This was a big sign to any would-be messiahs, don't mess with Rome. Or this could be you, right? right. So when we compare the Jesus, yeah. that's right. When we compare the Jesus movement to some of these other messianic movements, uh, how much similarity is there? How much dissimilarity is there? How does Jesus stand out amongst these other movements? Yeah, it's really fascinating. Uh, you know, 
and, and it's it's sad that you know so many books on the resurrection books that are you know great books in other ways but but just don't talk about this i, I really first discovered this when i was reading through josephus himself and also uh, of course nt wright uh, does a great job uh laying out um the the the, the parallels and, and differences between jesus and these other movements but by my count there's 14 uh, at least uh, from josephus from philo of alexandria and from some other writers we know of 14 other movements um ranging basically from about 40 BC, so about 40 years before Jesus is the first, right at right at the time that King Herod uh, begins reigning, and then um, uh, about 100 years after Jesus's crucifixion, so so about 135 AD. So, so you have a range of about 40 to 135, and then, you know, before that, before 40 BC, you don't really have anybody like this, and then after 135, the, the Jews basically give up on <laughs> fighting against Rome. They're, 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 they're going to be just uh, people of the Torah at that point. But the, the, the similarities is that we don't know exactly what some of these, uh, uh, many of them were claiming, but we know that they, Josephus tells us they claim to be a king, that they would claim to do um, miraculous uh, acts, that some of them even predicted the destruction of the temple. They clearly had large amounts of uh, followers. They had, they had, they had uh, quite a few disciples, some of them, uh, some of them in the thousands, uh, a lot more than Jesus in some cases. Uh, but but what makes really them different than Jesus uh, in all cases is the fact that they fought against Rome. So that's ultimately what led to their demise was that they ended up being crucified or beheaded or, you know, disappeared in some way. But ultimately, it was because they uh, fought against Rome. Uh, Jesus, of course, and he commanded his disciples, you know, put your sword back in his sheath, you know, you know, do not, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. So Jesus and his disciples did not fight against Rome, uh, but he was of course still crucified because they perceived him as a threat like these other messianic pretenders. Uh, but yeah, lots of similarities. And, and of course, then the ultimate difference would be that all of those other movements ended <laughs> after their leader, their messianic pretender or whatever they were exactly, they were claiming died. Those movements just ended. It was done. Uh, but with, Je with the Jesus movement, of course, their movement not only continued, but it went on to turn the Roman Empire upside down and became the largest religion in the world to this day. Mm. Uh, quite a difference. And I like to compare, you know, Jesus and Simon Bar Kokhba. Simon Bar Kokhba was the last of these messianic pretenders, really the most successful. I mean, he clearly had, if the sources are right, and they're probably exaggerated, but, but he had maybe hundreds of thousands of followers. He actually ruled over Jerusalem for about three years. He even issued coins that said year one for the redemption of Israel, year two for the redemption of Israel. He didn't, he didn't get to year three. So we don't have coins that say year three, but we found, we have letters from him that he wrote to his generals. Uh, but ultimately, uh, Hadrian, the, the emperor at the time, sent his general to uh, to, to behead him and, and crush his, his followers. But I like to compare the two because they both claim to be Messiah. You know, they both claim to be king. Both had disciples. Simon Bar Kokhba had so much many, you know, so much more. He actually had a physical kingdom for at least, you know, two and a half years. Hmm. And yet to this day, Jesus rules over, you know, a, 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 an empire that encompasses a third of the world. Mm -hmm. And Simon Bar Kokhba, no one really knows about him except people who study these specific aspects of, uh, uh, of this area, of this history. Uh, you know, many of your, you know, people watching this, listening to this probably didn't hear about Simon Bar Kokhba until I brought him up. Uh, mm -hmm. So how's that possible? You know, what, why isn't there, uh, wh where are the followers of Simon Bar Kokhba? Why isn't there a religion called uh, Bar Kokhbianity or Bar Kokhbianism? You know, wh wh where is that religion? Um, mm -hmm. how, how, did, how is Christianity, you know, the most dominant faith and religion in the world uh, based on this crucified man? It's just, it's, it's really just extraordinary. It's because Jesus rose from the dead and Simon Bar Kokhba stayed dead. Hmm. So why didn't any other messianic movement, especially Simon Bar Kokhba, why didn't they make the claim that their Messiah rose from the dead too? It's a great, you know, especially with Simon Bar Kokhba because they knew Christians. In fact, Justin Martyr, the early church father, Justin Martyr was not too far away when he, he refers back to the recent war <laughs> and the recent war for him was the Bar Kokhba revolt. And he talks about how Christians were persecuted and demand and 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 tortured if they did not curse Christ and and or, uh, Bar, Kok Bar Kokhba and his followers tried to get them to renounce and curse Jesus, and so so they knew the claims they knew about Christianity so it's it really is amazing that none of his followers you know 
imitated that. <laughs> you know, none of his followers said, well, you know, the Christian movement kept going, even though their leader died. So why can't mm-hmm. we say, why can't we say Simon rose from the dead? I, I just, it, it's clear their mindset was not like the 19th century Americans. Mm-hmm. Their mindset was, no, Simon is dead. That means it's over. I don't care what people say. He, he's not going to rise from the dead. So, wow. so it really so is amazing. Even with the Christian movement, they didn't have this idea of, oh, let's just say our Messiah you know, resurrected because that wasn't in their mindset. Even after Jesus, the movement after him with that idea already around because of the success of the the Christian movement, despite the crucifixion of Jesus, um, they didn't try to copy that because it would be ludicrous to try something like that. They couldn't copy the Christian message. Yeah, I don't think his 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 followers would have uh, uh, been interested in him in, in uh, continuing to follow him after he died. I think they were, mm-hmm. they were just angry. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so fascinating. Hey, if you're watching this right now or listening to us, please hit that like button. Now it really helps other people see this video on YouTube and uh, consider subscribing if you're enjoying this kind of content. Now we are going through just in the resurrection chapter of your book, The Bedrock of Christianity. And in that chapter, you talk about three pure innovations, you call them. And let's talk about each one of those. Um, the first one was was originally brought to my attention by N.T. Wright when he said, you know, if you take a look at the cross, people have crosses around their necks and they, you know, use the cross as like a, a design piece. But back in the first century, as we all know, the cross was not a lovely, precious moments kind of thing. It was not a Pinteresty kind of thing. It was a brutal, gory, mm. uh, death metal kind of gruesome device for torturing mm. people. And yet it's a historical fact that the Christians made the cross their symbol very early on. And you have to ask why that is, is because for them, it was a symbol of Jesus' love for them. And that was so powerful for me when, when I heard that. But talk about this being a pure innovation, this positive interpretation of the cross and, and a crucified Messiah. How, how do you see that as a pure innovation? Yeah, and, and on this, uh, another N.T. Wright's great to read, another just great little, it's a short work, but just packed with so much information, especially in the footnotes, just, just full of such amazing information on the cross and crucifixion in, in the ancient world. It's actually called Crucifixion in the Ancient World by uh, the German scholar uh, Martin Hengel, uh, H-E-N-G-E-L. Highly recommend that little work. But yeah, and, and he makes the point in that book that he he isn't aware of any positive interpretation of a philosopher, of a Jewish leader, like some of the ones we mentioned. Uh, many people were crucified in the ancient world, and no one ever looked at it as, oh, this is there's a good thing. There, 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 there's light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, there, there, there was never a positive look on that. It was always, this is shameful. This is the worst of deaths. This is the most gruesome of deaths. This is, that person must be cursed by God if they were crucified. And so this is what makes the early Christians so fascinating. Um, and so early, you know, they were probably not even called Christians as early as they were saying this, you know, that the sect of the Nazarenes or the, the, as the book of Acts calls them, the way. But this early movement following Jesus as the Messiah and risen again from the dead who had been crucified, they were saying, like Paul says, the cross is the power of God. It's the wisdom of God. I want to know nothing among you, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Where did they, where are they getting this idea that crucifixion is a positive thing? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, like, like you said, the cross ended up becoming this symbol that represented the power of God. You know, you want to see the power of God, the same power that brought the universe, the cosmos together. Look at the cross. Look at Jesus hanging on the cross. Mm-hmm. That's that's just it, it's a truly novel mutation, as Larry yeah. Hurtado, the late Larry Hurtado put it. The second pure innovation that uh, you mentioned in chapter five, I believe it is in your book, is that a crucified Messiah rose from the dead. Now, how is that different from people will say, well, but like. Lazarus was believed to have risen from the dead and Jesus was believed to have raised a little girl or people in the Old Testament. How is that different than uh, this innovation? Yeah, the, the, the second key innovation that I emphasize, and, and, and this kind of follows 1 Corinthians 15, you know, Christ died according to, you know, for our sins, according to the scriptures, he was buried and then he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So this claim that he was raised um, there it's a, a, a gyro, but, but, um, just a little bit later in first Corinthians 15, he's using it synonymously with anastasis. 
And this type of resurrection, this resurrection that the Jews were expecting at the end of the world, the one prophesied by Daniel uh, um, from Daniel chapter 12 that I quoted earlier, that type of resurrection is what the early Christians were saying began in Jesus. In fact, there's a great text in the book of Acts uh, chapter four in the early uh, part of chapter four, where they said that, that it says that they were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So it's not just that they were saying Jesus rose from the dead. It wasn't anything. It wasn't just like Lazarus coming back from death and then die again. In Jesus, the resurrection of the future that they're, that they're waiting for, mm. that future general resurrection has begun. Mm. It's already begun in Jesus, which means, and that, that's why I use, you know, I love the other language, new creation, you know, the new heavens and the new earth that's going to, you know, uh, transform the entire cosmos. That's already been done in the flesh of Jesus, in the corpse of Jesus, that new creation has already begun. And that's, that's what they were saying. And so, again, where did that idea come from? The positive interpretation of the cross and the fact that the Daniel resurrection has begun in this man, Jesus, this crucified man, Jesus. Incredible to me. Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. what and we know that this is what they were saying from the earliest. I mean, mm -hmm. First Corinthians 15, as we said, goes back to that first five years. Um, I like even Dale Allison in our discussion. He says it, it goes back to the first week. <laughs> this, mm -hmm. this all goes back to the first week. These, these unique innovations go back to the first week. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the third pure innovation you mentioned in your book, which is that Jesus was believed to be divine. And I might add something. This is how I started my, my dissertation, actually was uh, noting that very early on in a Jewish context, uh, Andrew Chester noted in 2011 that there was a virtual consensus that Jesus was believed to be divine very early on in a Jewish context. So talk a little bit about that, this where did this pure innovation uh, come from that Jesus was believed to be divine? Yeah, I mean, th th this has to be even the most, even though the other two are incredible, this is the most astonishing one. Oh, yeah. Again, no one is expecting the Messiah to be God in some sense, to be mm. divine in some sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not expected. Uh, and, and I'm amazed because, you know, I, I really believe when you go back into the Old Testament, you can find passages that does show that this, one who will come from David will be divine, will be in some sense God. Um, you have the Son of Man figure. You have uh, uh, many texts that I think, you know, suggest this, but it must have just been so radical. And because the Jews were so, such strict monotheists, they couldn't, you know, they just dismissed it. They, they, it. they just had to ignore it, I guess, because we don't find, but like we said, we we only have a small amount of, of information. So maybe there were Jews who were expected a, uh, a divine messiah, and we just don't have the, the literature. But of what we know, no one was expecting this. And so again, they're, they're not just saying Jesus uh, crucified, died for our sins, that he began the, the resurrection of Daniel. They're saying Jesus is uh, the God in the flesh. He is the Logos in the flesh. He is Yahweh in the flesh. He is the God who created all things as a human being. And, and you know, the later creeds would say fully God, fully man. You know, they're not they're not laying it out, you know, all clearly like that. But that I do think that's the right interpretation of what is being said in these earliest texts, like Philippians 2, uh, the, the hymn in Philippians 2 saying that he is preexistent. He has always been God. He added to himself a human nature. He became a human and he was crucified. And then he was raised as the God man. He was raised to the highest of heights. He was raised back to the right hand of God. And then it quotes Isaiah 45, which originally uh, is applied to Yahweh that mm -hmm. to Yahweh every knee will bow. That's every amazing. Will confess. Yeah. But now it's applied to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But in case in case the uh, the Sabellianists are are hanging around, Paul makes clear to the glory of God the Father. So it's not that Jesus has replaced the God of the Old Testament. It's it's not that he's replaced the Father. He is still um, uh, he he is Yahweh and the Father is Yahweh and the Spirit of Yahweh. But there's only one God. There's only one God. But but the, but so so this is how later on they would break this up and and really clarify how to understand the the three persons in the one God. But 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 that that's what you're left with with these texts like Philippians two. You're left with the fact that Jesus is now being presented as Yahweh in the flesh, but there's still God the Father. So how do you put this together? And so it took you know hundreds of years to for the Christians to really get the the language right in these creeds. But, but I think, you know, again, where, where did this idea come from that he would be God? 
And I think this, this, uh, and this goes, I, th- and I, I know to your dissertation, it goes back to the fact that Jesus himself claimed to be God, because mm-hmm. I, I think that if Jesus rose from the dead, that would be this monumental, obviously extraordinary event, but it, yeah. it wouldn't necessarily make them say Jesus was God. Right. I mean, if Elijah rose from the dead, they'd be like, what's going on? But they wouldn't say Elijah's God. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't say Elijah's Yahweh in the flesh, mm-hmm. but Jesus claimed to be the I am. He claimed to be uh, uh, God during his ministry. He claimed to be the son of man of Daniel seven and on and on and on. So, yeah. so I think it, it, it confirmed his claims and they put it all together and said, this, this is the God from all, you know, th- th- this is uh, our cre- creator God. You know, Jesus mm-hmm. is on that side uh, of the line. There's, there, there's the creator and there's creation. And Jesus is on the side of the creator God. Mm-hmm. Jesus is so fascinating on so many levels. And, you know, the, the more you study him, you just uh, you just can't can't plumb the depths of uh, the profundity of Jesus. I'll tell you one of the it's key possible. things. Yeah. One of the key things t- I took away from my dissertation work is that uh, I did a historical discussion of Jesus claims to possess divine authority. And it's historically arguable that Jesus uh, claimed to have divine authority on earth to forgive sins, like in Mark 2, and also divine authority in heaven to judge sins, like in his Jewish examination in Mark 14. And the claim to have authority in heaven and on earth is a merism for all of reality. Mm-hmm. Who claims that? You put all of Jesus' claims together. Uh, he is claiming jurisdiction over every part of the creation. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just amazing. So, yeah, it's, it's like seen, the Philippians do him. Every part right. of creation will ultimately acknowledge that whether willingly or unwillingly yeah well it seems pretty unlikely that his disciples made up the whole resurrection story we know it didn't just emerge over decades and decades from other christians we we have paul writing about uh the resurrection of jesus even even before any uh gospels were written Um, and so if you were to put yourself in my shoes that one day that you had uh you know a relative a family gathering come to you and just tell you that the resurrection of Jesus was something that disciples probably just made up or it just emerged after many decades of uh, cultural reflection. Uh, what's a short answer you could give to somebody like that to give them something to think about at a family gathering, that kind of situation? You know, a, a very simple way I like to say it is, you know, two undeniable facts of history. You know, we've talked about many undeniable facts, but, 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 but just two would be Jesus was crucified and this movement right in the place where he was crucified in Jerusalem, you know, within weeks, you know, within months at most emerged, exploded out of this very place. And that movement has gone on to take over the whole world. What got this movement going? You know, Jesus, if Jesus died and stayed dead, how did this movement begin? Mm-hmm. How did this movement, this, this, this movement that we call Christianity, how did it go on to conquer the barbarians, to conquer the Roman Empire, to become the largest religion in the world. How did this happen? You know, where did it all come from if Jesus stayed dead? And and that would be just something simple I would start talking about. And then you could talk about all the other, you know, evidence like the appearances. You know, uh, James believed Jesus appeared to him. We have the 500. We have the 12. What did they see? That, that's a simple question I like to ask uh, unbelievers. I say, well, we know they saw something. And we know, at least in the case of Peter, Paul and James, that they went to their death Mm -hmm. believing they they saw him. So what did they see? You know, I encourage skeptics who who are looking at, you know, this information and looking at the historical facts, you know, I I would say, seek and you will find, you know, you know, quoting Jesus, you know, seek and you will find, you know, if you follow the evidence where it leads, I believe you will, you will end up like Thomas falling at the the, the feet of Jesus, the risen Jesus saying, my Lord and my God. So, so look into it you know, look into it with an open heart, look into it with humility and look at the evidence, you know, even the, the, the far, you know, very skeptical scholars agree on these facts and just follow this evidence where it leads, even if it leads to uh, wonderful and even scary places like the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, because of course that will then, uh, you know, change everything about your reality and what, what, what's happening, but it's the, it's the greatest uh, news of the world. It's, it's forgiveness of sins. It's the fact that he conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the devil. Uh, he gives us true freedom. He gives us that true life and, and life to the full. Uh, it's everything that we could ever you know, hope or dream for if Jesus rose from the dead. Well, Justin, thank you so much for being on the Accessible Apologetics show today. Thank you so much. It's great, great being on.
And if people want to connect with you, how can they do that? They, they can follow uh, a, a newsletter I put out uh, regularly. Go, go to my website, uh, justinwbass.com and subscribe there. I have a YouTube channel and then I'm on Facebook and, and Twitter. Awesome. Well, we will link those in the description below. We'll also link to his book, The Bedrock of Christianity. You can check that out as well as a variety of other resources that we've mentioned in this show. I want to thank you so much for joining me today on the Accessible Apologetics Show. I'm your apologetics guy, Dr. Mikel Del Rosario. And until next time, keep the faith.